Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this sleeping beauty is Julie Oliver and she's a dog. So about a month ago I made two videos covering various science mistakes made by ivermectin fans. I thought at the time that I had pretty much covered every science mistake but then I saw a whole lot more which means now I've had to make part three. So let's go back to the science and have a look. Size mistakes one to nine are in parts one and two, so we'll be starting with size mistake number 10. And it's quite a doozy. It's people sharing scientific papers that they just don't understand and falsely thinking they've found proof that ivermectin actually works. This slide shows four studies that I've recently seen touted as evidence that ivermectin is effective. The first one has the title Microscopic Interactions Between Ivermectin and Key Human and Viral Proteins Involved in SARS-CoV-2 Infection. Now you could be forgiven for thinking that they actually had a look at these interactions under a microscope, but they didn't. And it wouldn't be possible because ivermectin and proteins are way too small to be seen under any microscope. The virus itself can be seen under an electron microscope, but you can't see individual proteins. This study actually doesn't involve any experimentation at all. It is just computer modeling. What about the next study? It's called Elimiquinone marine sponge metabolite as a novel inhibitor of SARS-CoV-2 key target proteins in comparison with suggested COVID-19 drugs. Designing docking a molecular dynamic simulation study. What a mouthful, hey? Well, that's also a computer modeling study with no experiments. Hmm. Maybe the next one might have some experiments. It's called Exploring the Binding Efficacy of Ivermectin Against the Key Proteins of SARS-CoV-2 Pathogenesis and In Silico Approach. Well, the title's a bit of a giveaway. In silico means computer modeling, so no experiments here either. Fourth time lucky? The final paper is entitled Molecular Docking Reveals Ivermectin and Remdesivir as Potential Repurposed Drugs Against SARS-CoV-2. What's molecular docking? It's a computer modeling technique. No experiments here either. So basically none of these studies provide any evidence whatsoever that ivermectin works. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing any of the studies. Computer modeling is a valuable tool that helps scientists initially screen compounds to see if they could possibly have an effect. And they are only meant to be a first step. The next step should be to perform experiments to determine if the compounds actually live up to the promise. And in many cases, they won't. But you will sometimes find a few that do. Now, the next science mistake builds on the mistake of not understanding scientific papers to make the even bigger mistake of claiming that ivermectin works in exactly the same way as the new Pfizer antiviral drug, and that they are both, in fact, protease inhibitors. If you don't know, proteases are a type of enzyme that are used by viruses as part of their replication process. They basically chop long virus proteins into smaller pieces that are the right size. So if you can inhibit the right protease, you can stop the virus from replicating. Now, computer modeling studies are used as so-called evidence that ivermectin is a protease inhibitor, but there is one paper that does actually have some experiments. So let's take a look at it. This is a paper and it was published in Communications Biology, which is quite a reputable journal. And this paper also has quite a bit of computer modeling, but they have done a few experiments. And at first glance, one of them looks quite good for ivermectin. Here are the results and it appears that ivermectin is an absolute star. It inhibits the protease so much better than the compounds that it is being compared with. But the devil is in the detail. The first thing to note is that it is being compared with a bunch of compounds that you wouldn't really expect to work. So basically it's just the best of a bad bunch. And even that might be being generous because we could just be seeing what is known as a false positive. This figure explains how the compounds are tested. You start with a specific protease, which is known as 3CL. You then mix it with your drug and you let them hang out together for a while. If the drug is an inhibitor, during the time it will bind to the protease. To find out if it has bound to the protease, you then add what is known as a fluorogenic substrate. And these are really cool. The fluorogenic substrate becomes fluorescent if it binds to the 3CL. 
and you can then calculate how much inhibition has occurred by measuring the degree of fluorescence. So that's how the test is supposed to work, but what can sometimes happen is that the compound you are testing binds to the fluorogenic substance and stops it binding to the 3CL. When this happens, the fluorescent reading will tell you that you have inhibition, but really you don't. And this is known as a false positive. Now, there are further tests that can be done to determine if you have a false positive or not, but they haven't been done in this paper. And that's fine. They've made it clear that further testing is necessary. However, let's assume for the sake of argument that the results aren't a false positive and ivermectin really did inhibit the 3CL in the test. Would that mean that it worked in the same way as the Pfizer product? In a word, no. A common way to compare the potency of drugs is using what is known as the IC50 value. The IC50 is the concentration of a drug necessary to produce 50% inhibition. Now, the IC50 of ivermectin was calculated in the paper we are discussing, and this is the value. 21,530 nanomoles per litre. And if you're thinking that looks like a very big number, you're right. In comparison, the IC50 of the new Pfizer drug, which they are calling Paxlovid, is 3.11 nanomoles per litre. And that makes Paxlovid about 7,000 times more potent. But does it really matter if you need to use heaps more ivermectin? After all, we keep getting told how cheap it is. Well, Yes, it does matter, because we can only take a dose that is safe. This paper actually surveyed the literature and reported what levels of ivermectin were achievable in the blood at both standard doses and overdoses. This table summarises what they found. At standard doses, the maximum concentration achieved is between 23.1 and 92.6 nanomoles per litre, which is 233 to 932 times less than the IC50 value. Even if we go to overdose levels, the maximum concentration is only 282 nanomoles per litre, which is 76 times less than the IC50 value. Now, some people argue that these concentrations don't matter because ivermectin accumulates in the lungs. This has never actually been shown in humans, but it has been shown in animals. However, its concentration in the lungs is still only about double that in the blood. And when it accumulates in tissues, it's mainly bound to the tissues, so it isn't actually available for binding to proteases. Now, we did discuss in part two that ivermectin had major tolerability issues when used at three to six times the approved dose. So clearly we don't want to be taking doses hundreds of times higher. Also, since I recorded my last ivermectin video, another paper has been published showing safety issues when ivermectin is used at higher than approved doses. Here it is, and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and was authored by three doctors at Oregon Health and Science University. And they investigated 21 people who had called the Oregon Poison Center in August 2021 after taking ivermectin for either prevention or treatment of COVID. Of the 21 people, six required hospitalization and four required ICU treatment. Thankfully, none of them died. The toxic effects they displayed included severe episodes of confusion, seizures, ataxia, which is abnormal uncoordinated movements, and hypotension, which is very low blood pressure. The doses taken varied by person, but in some cases, the doses taken were only 21 milligrams, which is only two times the approved dose, which of course is way below the dose necessary to achieve any protease inhibition. So to summarize, ivermectin does not work in the same way as the Pfizer drug Paxlovid. And as we discuss in parts one and two, there is currently no evidence that it works at all. Now I'd like to cover a completely different science mistake made by ivermectin fans, and that is thinking doctors are infallible. I see this quite a bit in the comments with people stating that doctors who are using ivermectin know it works and therefore we should just listen to them and ignore the randomized clinical trials showing that it doesn't work. And of course, the doctors are also saying it themselves. Some of the most vocal doctors making this claim are Pierre Corey and Paul Marrick from the FLCCC. As it happens, they have just had a paper retracted. 
In this paper, they claimed that the death rate amongst hospitalised patients using the Math Plus protocol was 6.1%. And they compared this with mortality rates reported in the literature, which ranged from 156 to 32%, which sounds pretty impressive. Only problem, it wasn't true. The hospital where the trial took place checked their records and it turns out that the mortality rate amongst the patients who received all four of the Math Plus therapies was actually 28%, just a bit more than 6%. Now, just to be clear, this trial was done before ivermectin was added to the Math Plus protocol, so it's not directly relevant to ivermectin. But what it does show is that doctors who are advocates can sometimes see what they want to see and can think something is working when it actually isn't. And that's one of the reasons that doctors as well as patients are blinded in clinical trials. Speaking of attractions, another size mistake made by ivermectin fans is failing to check the provenance of the studies they are using to support their claims. This study was actually retracted ages ago but ivermectin fans are still using it as evidence for ivermectin. Instead of linking to the journal's website where it is clear that it has been retracted, they link to a PDF copy of it on an anti-vax website. Now, while we're on the subject of retractions, yet another ivermectin study has joined the long list of ivermectin studies that have been retracted. Here's the paper and it features in some meta-analyses claiming to show a benefit for ivermectin. The reason it was retracted was because it was based on fake data. According to the authors, they created a fake data file for training purposes and accidentally sent the wrong file to the data analysts. Simple mistake. Interestingly, on the same day that this paper was retracted, another reasonably large ivermectin randomized controlled trial reported its results. This trial was undertaken by the Malaysian Institute for Clinical Research and it involved 500 patients aged 50 and above with comorbidities who were randomly assigned to either ivermectin or standard of care. Patients in the ivermectin group received 0.4 milligrams per kilogram for five days. What did they find? Well, in terms of efficacy, there was no difference between the groups. Both had the same rate of progression to serious disease and the time progression was also the same. The one difference that was seen between the groups was in terms of adverse events. Those in the ivermectin group had three times more adverse events than those in the standard of care group. And the most common adverse event was diarrhea. So there are still no randomized trials that aren't fraudulent or seriously flawed showing a benefit for ivermectin. The one final science mistake that I would like to mention is using ad hominem attacks instead of addressing the science. This is a common tactic from people who can't come up with a valid argument. And I seem to be seeing quite a bit of this in the comments on my videos. Luckily, I've got a thick skin and the commenters are actually doing me a favor because YouTube algorithm is more likely to recommend videos with lots of interactions. So feel free to keep leaving insulting comments or if you like my videos, you could leave a nice comment and maybe like and share my video, but only if you want to. Now you'll find links to the studies I've referenced in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.